Hey, good morning, everybody. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm part of the teaching team here at Journey. I've been away for a few weeks. It's really good to be home. It's great to be back worshiping with you guys. There's no place like home. Can I get an amen? So we're in this series called Low Hanging Fruit. And as I started to prepare for it, um, you know, one of the things that continues to weigh heavy on my mind is just how relentless the enemy is in his attacks in our generation. You know, as Adam was sharing a little bit earlier about um, how these walls that the enemy puts up between us and our ability to get into God's presence, um, one of the main tactics that he seems to use in our generation, probably every generation, is fear. Have you noticed the headlines of late, maybe over the past couple of years? You know, we went from a political crisis to a pandemic, from a pandemic to racial strife, from people questioning their very identity as who they are as human beings to starting to think that they're a fluffy dog or cat that's running around and that's normal. This is not normal, people. We find ourselves now in the midst of an economic crisis and inflation. There's an energy crisis with our oil. There's a food crisis, supposedly, that's abounding around the corner. And all of these things are occurring at the same time, I might add. There's wars and rumors of wars and maybe even the threat of nuclear annihilation on the horizon. Anybody fearful yet? I mean, come on, Jesus, all these things that they keep throwing at us. And oh, guess what? There's an election in like a week. So there has to be yet another political crisis around the corner, does there not, right? That's the world that we live in. That's the tactic that the enemy uses. He wants to instill fear in the hearts of all of mankind. It's part of what he wants to do to keep us in fear and continually on the edge but this I know, out of times of great tragedy and pressure tends to come some really great triumphs, right? God is triumphant. You know, the Gospel of Luke speaks a little bit about the day and age that we live in, and it concludes by giving us some great hope. In Luke 21, 25, it says, There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth, the stress of all nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will even be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption draws near. There is hope in the midst of challenge. There's hope in the midst of tragedy. There's hope in the midst of fear. And guess what? God wants to use you as an agent of hope. Do you believe that today? He wants you to bear good fruit in our generation as a sign to those who are struggling that he is alive and he still loves them. In fact, Luke says in Luke chapter 2 verse 10, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Good news is what we have to share. Do you know one of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness? That's what we're going to explore today. Father, we thank you. We praise you. In the midst of a world where we're kept on edge continually, always wondering, always in fear, where people turn to substances to try to mitigate that pain, when people turn to all kinds of other things to keep them from the reality of it, we know that we have the answer and the answer is you. The answer is found in the fact that you came here to earth, lived a sinless, spotless life, died a sinner's death on our behalf, and rose again that we might have life. We are carriers of that good news. We are carriers of your goodness. Would we spread that like a virus in our generation, bringing hope to all the world in Jesus' name? And everybody says, amen. amen. So I, I shared a little bit of a quote, out of times of great tragedy and pressure comes great triumphs. Think about that for a moment. Take Jesus' death for instance. When you look at it on the surface, it's a very tragic moment, right? But out of that, didn't there come a great triumph because he rose again three days later, right? This is a true story we're reading here today. 
This is true. God really did rise from the dead, and it changed everything. It is good news for all who believe. And in light of that fact, for those of us who are here in this room who call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ, we are compelled from the bottom of our hearts at the core of our very being to go out and share this good news with others. We're called to evangelize. We're called to go outside the walls of the church like you heard with Seeds of Love just a little bit earlier. Get outside the walls of the church. Go out there into the community. Love on people. Be there for people. Connect with people in your neighborhood. Connect with people in your workplace. Share the love of God with them because guess what? They might die and go to hell without a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no more important message that we have to share with the world. And when the world is in distress, it provides really good opportunities to share the gospel. I was reading a book that was set in the Great Depression era. And the author wrote the following. Just now, the whole world is undergoing a change of such stupendous proportions that millions of people have become panic-stricken with worry, doubt, indecision, and fear. It seems to me that now is a splendid time for those who have come to the crossroads of doubt to endeavor to become acquainted with God. When people are in fear, when they don't understand their own identity, this is an opportunity for you and I to share the good news of the gospel with them. They will be receptive. They will listen to you. They're looking for answers. And let me tell you, they're not going to find them in their politicians. They're not going to find them in their checkbooks. They're only going to find them in the hope of the world that is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? That's the message you carry. That is the hope that lies within you for this lost and hurting generation. The Great Depression was a terrible time on the earth. It ultimately led to World War II. Thankfully, during yet another tragic time in history, great men and women arose to the occasion and fought off tyranny, right? Out of the ashes of that pain came many years of peace and some incredible miracles like the rebirth of the nation of Israel. It never would have happened had not we gone through that particular tragedy. And we're witnessing a miracle in its rebirth even in our own generation. Yet sadly, it seems, we as human beings are destined to make some of the same mistakes of the past in our own generation. Have you ever noticed that? We just keep doing the same dumb stuff over and over again. None of you ever do that, do you? Only me, right? None of you ever make the same dumb mistakes over and over again, right? We do that as humans. But man, is there hope that I want to share with you today. I want to repeat it. In the midst of great fear, there's an opportunity for the people of God to rise up and bring hope to this very lost and hurting generation. But where does it start? Adam talked about revival a little bit earlier. You know, revival in mass can't start without revival in one. It needs to start inside of you and I. That's where it starts. In prayer, in repentance, in humility, in loving others enough to get outside of ourselves to cry out to God for revival. See, as God changes your life and sets you on fire, guess what? People are looking at you and they're going to be like, what is different about you? Oh my goodness, something has changed in you. And if you've been a believer for some time and you've lost that fire, may you find it again right here, right now, today. Would God reinstill in you that fire to go out there and share the good news? Man, we need to get out there. There's so many people that are lost and hurting, Journey Church, would we go out there and share and share and share and share? We find ourselves in a series that Journey has entitled Low Hanging Fruit. What are those easy things that we could do? You don't have to go do crazy things to go out there and make a difference. Some of you will get to do some crazy things to go out there and make a difference. Some of that's going to get birth right here in this place today. But where does it start? With the little faithful things doing the little things, the small things, that low-hanging fruit to make a difference, and then it builds and builds and builds, and it begins to manifest in our lives and in the, other, in the lives of others. See, all of us are bearing fruit. You have to realize that, right? Do you get that? 
Some of you are bearing good fruit, some good juicy fruit. I mean, just awesome fruit. And some of you are bearing some nasty fruit (laughs) that nobody wants to eat. Lord, may we bear good fruit. See, the fruits of the Spirit are the evidence that the good news of the gospel has taken root in our lives. That that seed that was planted in you has begun to grow up and sprout and bear good fruit. That's the sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. And much of the book of Galatians compares and contrasts living by faith and living by the law as you approach this section of scripture that talks about how we are to bear good fruit. He talks about doing good works and he gives us the reasoning behind it. See, living by the law will destroy, yet living by faith and living in the power of the Holy Spirit will bring in and usher in a new way of living, not by the law, but by faith. Galatians 3.11 says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather. The one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from a curse. Aren't you glad? He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith, right? See, the good news is that Jesus died on your behalf. That you could never fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. That's the foundation of our faith. That Jesus loved you enough that in the midst of your sin, he came and died for you. That you could be in relationship with him. That is great news. That is amazing news. That is wonderful news for those of us who are sinners. And guess what? All of us are sinners, right? Saved by grace through faith. He builds on this, Galatians 4, 8, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods, but now that you have come to know God or rather be known by God, how can you then turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to become once more? What is he saying here in that? You know, we live in a generation where there's a new term of late called deconstructing your faith. I hadn't even heard of this thing up until the past couple of years. But people are deconstructing their faith. He's saying, how have you so quickly turned to another gospel? How do we as believers so quickly go back to these lies, go back to the things of the world, go back to our old ways of living? It's rampant in Christianity, is it not? I've been around Christianity for a long time, and I've seen some crazy stuff. I don't know about you, right? Some stuff that gets you shaking your head. Man, can't we just live by what we read in the Word? Can't we, can't we love God? Can't we strive to live a holy life? Can't we strive to live differently than our fellows and look differently? Why do we look just like the world? See, the brand of Christianity that we've been sold in America over the past 20 years has been no good for the most part. There's been a lot of stuff in it where we've sought out the right speaker who's the eloquent, gifted speaker to get up there, um, and we end up worshiping them rather than worshiping the one true God. And guess what? Most of them, it's proven, have failed us, right? One after another after another. Don't come to church to seek out me. Don't come to church to seek out Adam. Don't come to church to seek out the lights. Don't come to church to seek out the video. Don't come to church to hear the great worship. Come to church to connect with the one true God, the living God who died that you might have life. That's what it's about, loving the King of kings and Lord of lords. He goes on with a a slight warning, then we're going to get on to all the good stuff. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Who's he speaking to? 
He's speaking to a church. Some things haven't changed. People still do all. Would you say that any of these things are fruits of the spirit that should be evidenced in the lives of a believer from that list that we just read? Yet guess what? Even as he corrected them in the book of Galatians, that craziness still goes on in our generation. And we accept it for some reason. He didn't accept it. He lovingly confronted it. And he said, there is yet a better way to live. There's a better way to live. These are the verses that are setting up Galatians 5.22. You can't get to the fruits of the Spirit without dealing of those bad fruits that are manifest in the, in the lives of many believers, right? He's saying to us, you need to get rid of those things. If you're here and you're struggling in those areas of your life today, I always say they're strongholds for a reason. Man, there's no shame in admitting like, man, I've got issues. Some of the things, Eric, that you read out right there, I don't want to be in my life anymore. Guess what? If you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess that kind of thing between you and God here in this place, maybe, just maybe, today is the day of breakthrough for you. Today is the day that you'll be set free, that you'll no longer live that way, that you'll be positioned to bear good fruit. And here's one of the things that I would share with you as we get into this next set of verses. One of the things that I did, um, I'm pretty dense and I forget things sometimes, but one of the things that I do is I have a to-do list and it has these features like where you can go in and say, do this every day, um, do this once a week, do this once a month. I set this one as a once a month reminder to inspect my own life, to allow the Holy Spirit to be a fruit inspector in my life. Are these things evident in my life or is there work to do to remind me of the importance of such a thing? You know, maybe, just maybe, don't let this message go by the wayside and forget everything except maybe a funny story that I tell. Go put it in your phone and do a fruit inspection on your life once a month and say, where am I at with these things? Do I need to change? Lord, where am I at? It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Where are you at in that love category? Have you been loving people well? It's joy. Are you joyful or are you grumpy all the time? If you're grumpy all the time, that's not good. Are you at peace in your life? Is there peace in your life? Patience. When's the last time you cussed out the person in line in front of you for being too slow? I know Blanding will try you, but come on, Jesus. Help us out here. Kindness. Are you kind? Goodness is the one I'm going to focus on for the remainder of the message. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. You know, you got to crucify those things. You got to go a war. You got to go to war against the things of the flesh or they will continue to creep up in your life. Have you realized that? You got to fight against them. They're not going to go willingly. They want to keep creeping back up. You got to beat them down. You got to get control over your mind, your will, and your emotions as well as your body. It's a pretty serious list that we read, both the good parts and the bad. For today's purposes, let's hone in on one attribute goodness. Just as Paul wrote to the Galatians, he also wrote to the Ephesians, and he spoke of this contrast between faith and works. He debated the two. Ephesians 2.8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. I read that earlier. Important to remember. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This says a number of things to me. The motivation for our good works is grace. It's the grace of God that set us free that motivates us to do good works. You don't do good works so that you could get favor or offset bad things that you did in your life with God. It doesn't work that way. You can never do enough good works to get saved, amen, right? You can't do it. That's not the motivation. The motivation for going out there and doing good works is the very fact that God saved you by grace and freed you from the law, right? I love him. He saved me. He delivered me. Now, because of that, I want to share the goodness of God with others. It compels me to go out there and live differently than I was before. 
But he also says some important things here. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The very reason that you're saved, the very reason that you're here on earth is to do what? Did you read it? You're acting like you didn't read it. It's to do good works, which he planned for you beforehand. There's things he wants you to do. There's a race that he's called you to run. There's something that he wants you to accomplish. And guess what? The devil wants to put up all those roadblocks with fear and sin and insecurity and identity crisis and keeping you busy and keeping you running after money, keeping you working too much so that you can't accomplish the good works that God's called you to do. You need to kick his butt. You need to take authority over your flesh and the works of the devil so that you could be positioned to do what God created you to do. Do you want to have peace? Do you want to have joy? Do you want to have patience? Do you want to have kindness? Do you want to express goodness? Then you got to be doing what God's called you to do. Maybe the reason some of y'all so grumpy is you're not doing what God's called you to do. Put it behind you that you could do what he has called you to do. Our very lives and character as believers should be a demonstration of good works. Think about that for a moment. If people, if you were to die today, right now, and people were to start to talk about you and they would get up here and they're going to start to say all the nice things about you and some will joke about the bad things that you did, how would they characterize your life and the way that you're living? Would they say, man, they were someone who, whose life was characterized by doing good works with others? I could only pray that that would be said of me or any of us who are here. See, in Titus 2.7, it also says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. It also says in the book of Titus, Paul challenged them as well as the Ephesians, as well as the Galatians. It says, be zealous for good works as well as to be ready for every good work. Be zealous for it. Go for it. Get out there and live your life to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' name. That's been one of the mottos of my life. Live your life to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' name. Do so many good works that you forget about what you even did. I had to laugh. I don't say this to bring attention to myself or anything of that nature, but we were visiting a friend. Hadn't seen him in many, many years. And he said, Eric, when my ho his house burned down. And he goes, Eric, when my house burned down, you were the only guy that ever even sent me money. And I'm like, I don't even remember doing anything. <laughs> like, I was like, don't even remember. It's not something I even, I, I completely forgot about it. But that little thing to me that I didn't even remember impacted him so much that 15 years later, he's remembering that, man, you were the only one who actually stepped out during that rough season in my life. God wants to use you in that way. He wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of others. Would we be compelled to do good works? Titus 3.4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy for the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. When you do good works before others, it does something in their spirit, even as it changes and transforms you. But Eric, where do we start? What do I do? Remember I said start small. Scripture tells us to be faithful with little. I think a lot of people go out there with their big dreams straight up and they're like, this is what God's called me to do. And then guess what? It's kind of hard to get there, right? And then sometimes we give up way too early. What if you started with something very small that would lead you in that particular direction and see what God does along the way? Maybe he would do something along the way to get you towards that big dream of where he wants you to be. Some of you need to do something as simple as signing up to be on a serve team instead of coming to service every single time. 
See, now that I'm not the lead pastor anymore, I can say stuff like that. Some of y'all come, keep, you keep here, you keep showing up every week, you're sucking in, you're soaking in, you're enjoying, you're worshiping, but you're not pouring out and that will become like a stale pond. You will go nowhere with that. Sign up and serve, it's that easy. How hard is it to greet somebody at the door? Oh, I forgot some of y'all grumpy. I don't want y'all greeting at the door. <laughs> but maybe you get up there and you start greeting at the door and a smile comes on your face. You know, go back there and serve with the kids. Maybe some of you have got talent to serve on the worship team. Do that. Serve in media. There's tons of opportunities. You want to do something big. You want a God to bless you with big stuff, but you won't even serve. How do you expect to be blessed? Not that I'm linking one of the other, to be frank with you, because you could do it and maybe God doesn't give you what you want because he's protecting you from something. But you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. There's other opportunities like you heard about today, seeds of love. Where's Lewis in them? Where, where's, where's, okay. Man, man, if God could use Lewis, he could use anybody, bro. I mean, like. <laughs> now, Lewis is one of the best guys you'll ever be, and I love to pick on him. But, man, like, look at them. They stepped out in faith, and now God's using them to help 200 people a month. I bet it didn't start that way, if you ask him. I bet it started with something small, but maybe you're looking for something you could do. Go plug in with Lewis and them and go out there and make a difference. Sue and Harold, I saw you guys a little bit earlier. Where are you guys at? Stand up, raise your hands. Sue and Harold lead Journey out. Go out with them. They go out there and make a difference all the time. You know, stop by over there in the next steps. I'm sure they will hook you up with some opportunities to go out there and make a difference. Maybe even just do something as simple as grabbing some of those cards out there in the lobby. And inviting somebody to church. Do a little something extra. When you go out to lunch this afternoon, give a little bit of a bigger tip than you normally would. Be nice to the waitress. Love on them. Tell them how much God loves them. Pay for the next person in line. Do something in the name of Jesus and watch what God does. Start small. Start small. And guess what he does? Or if you're brave enough, I encourage you to pray the prayer that Adam talked about just a couple of weeks ago. During the scriptures on Nehemiah, he said, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. I dare you to genuinely pray that prayer. I dare you to genuinely pray that prayer. Can I tell you about a guy who did? We had the opportunity to hang out in um, Zimbabwe, Bulawayo, uh, Zimbabwe this past week. And I, w I went there because there's a friend that I hadn't seen in 15 years, and his name is Mike Peer. And um, if you know Mike Peer, um, which many of you, you probably don't, you're going to get to see a picture of him in just a moment. But um, I met Mike over probably 20 years ago. And when I first met Mike, um, he had just got saved, and he was dealing with addiction problems. And in fact, he was a NASA rocket scientist who started dabbling with substances, those substances took him to the place where he became a full-blown crack addict, and man, his life went from being a NASA rocket scientist to being just the lowest of the low. When I first met him, he just got saved. He was on fire for the Lord. He was overcoming his addiction. Hallelujah. Praise God. Give it up for everybody who's overcoming addiction right here and continuing to fight it. But you look at him at that particular point, you're like... This guy is not going to do nothing big. I mean, look at the kind of, you know, crazy life that he did. But what did he do? He started serving faithfully. And then one day he got invited on a missions trip to go on a short-term missions trip. And he raised the money, he raised the funds like other people. And, and he went on a short-term missions trip. And then God began to plant some seeds in his heart. And he's like, wow, this is a little bit weird. Before you know it, he kept faithfully serving inside the walls of the church. He was going out on outreaches. He went on this short-term missions trip, and they asked him to start to lead the short-term missions trips at that church. So he began facilitating short-term missions trips. He's getting other people. I went on a trip with him to Peru. We had an amazing time back then ministering to people down there. It was just awesome. And Mike was going from place to place, facilitating it. And then right around the time we planted Journey Church, um, I got a call from Mike because he went to Zimbabwe and he just never came home. <laughs> He showed up there and he's like, this is where God wants me. <laughs> he called back to the church and he said, I'm not going back. <laughs> he's been there for 15 years. And when he first got there, 
you know, he had absolutely nothing. He had no connections. He ended up meeting this guy named Dixon. And I think you guys might have a picture of uh, Dixon and all of us on the screen. They got a few pictures. So just to give you an idea, this is Mike on the, on the corner here, th this guy. Um, he literally gave up everything. You know, he could have got sober and went back to being a rocket scientist and making all kinds of money. But what did he do? He ended up giving his life up for the people in Zimbabwe. So this is Mike Dixon is the senior pastor next to him. And the team that's over here on the left, uh, one is the executive pastor of the church. And then in the middle there are the people that are leading the Bible college that they have. You know, the ministry that he had started as nothing. Today they feed 80,000 children per day. Did you hear that right? 80,000 children per day because he stepped out in faith, right? 80,000. They planted over 22 churches already and still going. 22 churches. A crack addict goes on to preach and goes on to build 22 churches. How amazing is that? They've drilled over 50 water wells, bringing life-giving water to the communities that are around them. They typically plant them inside of the schools because they also do the feeding through the schools. Could you imagine in their area of Bulawayo, there's 150 schools. Only 50 of them have running water because of them. Only 50. How crazy is that? Could you even imagine? We got a couple other pictures. I'll just share a couple with you. Um, these are the kids. This is their kids' church that's outside. They got church outside, people. If the, if the temperature goes out here and the AC goes out, half the people in church are going to be leaving an American church, right? <laughs> I mean, they don't even have a facility for their kids. They're meeting outside. Go on to the next one. Um, these are some of the kids I met. Oh, my goodness. These were... Um, just out there in the community near where they, they're at. Um, they actually built an area around where they have a women's empowerment program where 30 women are helping plant and learn how to grow food and then they have sell food and it's just an amazing thing. Um, maybe go on to the next one. Oh, that, that's, that's for you guys. That's the, the town center mall right there. Come on, let's go. You wanna go to the town center mall? That's the town center mall. Maybe just one or two more. Um, that's one of the beautiful church facilities that they ended up uh, building. Do we got any more? I don't know how many. Okay, these kids, this one was really, man, that one's tough. There's a gold mine that's there. And th these families live in these houses that were built like in the 50s that don't even have running water. And they're like this big, you know, they're, they're super small. And uh, they have to go use a communal bathroom area in order to do it. And the kids grow up really with generational no hope. And the church was able to plant like a city on a hill. The church right there, they gave them the... the the Zimbabwe actually gave them the land to build the church and they put the church right there at the top of that community and they're changing lives right there inside of that community. It's amazing to see. Um, those are the water wells that they build at scale. So there's a neighborhood adjacent to that where the church is, where there's a huge neighborhood like the size of the town of Orange Park that has zero water and zero electricity and they come to the church to be able to get water from them. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, in a few places of the world I've seen, the kids are actually living in the dump and eating from the dump, living in the dump. Could you imagine that? But man, to demonstrate God's goodness in the midst of that, a crack addict from Florida that God would use to go out there and begin to transform an entire city and beyond. God wants to use you to do stuff like that. He wants you to bear good fruit. He wants you to lay aside the sinful things that are in your life so that you could be fully used by him to make a difference in our generation. In this world that's full of fear, you could bring hope to your neighbor, but you're going to have to prioritize it. You got to get out of living for yourself. You got to say, man, I am no longer going to live for myself. I'm going to live my life to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' name. And I pray that that'll take root, that seed that I'm trying to plant in your heart today will take root. And 20 years from now, should the Lord allow me to still be here, to still be alive on this earth, I'm going to hear of the great, amazing deeds that some of you in this room have done in Jesus' name. Would you rise with me? We're already running long. Let's pray.